All right. Um, well, thanks everyone for making it out uh, to the first discrete math seminar of this academic year. Um, we're very excited to have our, our own Drew Meyer uh, kicking off this uh, seminar this year. And uh, he's going to be speaking about anti Ramsey number of edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees in all graphs. Uh, take it away, Drew. Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, everybody, for making it out. I'm excited to you know, finally have something of, of my own uh, to, to present in this seminar. So this is a result that uh, Lincoln Xu and I worked on um, in the early part of the summer. Um, and I, I really like this result because I think that it is a it's very reasonable to present almost the entire thing in 50 minutes. So I think that, um, you know, if there's any point that maybe definitions have been lost or um, you know, maybe I'm going too fast or something, please tell me to, to slow down or, or, or feel free at any point to interrupt and, and ask me what's going on. Um, so uh, to, to sort of get our feet wet with the type of problem that we're going to be talking about, I want to first do this kind of toy example, um, which asks the, the type of question that we're going to be dealing with, um, but in a, in a small enough setting to where we can really see what's going on. Um, so the, the question that I want to ask is, is how many colors can I pack onto the edges of uh, a K4 um, so as to avoid a rainbow spanning tree as a subgraph? Um, here by rainbow, I just mean that every edge gets a different color. Um, and so as with any question like this, you know, you should ask yourself, is the question interesting? Does it sort of make sense? And you can think, well, if, if, if I color all of the edges of K4 with the same color, then certainly there's no rainbow spanning tree. Um, why? Well, because a spanning tree would have to have three edges and necessarily all those edges are red. So, okay, um, I can do it with one color. Um, what if I color every edge um, with a different color? Uh, well, with a different color. Well, in this case, certainly there's a rainbow spanning tree. And in fact, any spanning tree is rainbow necessarily because every edge got a different color. Um, and so uh, the problem at least is interesting. And, you know, where does the the, the switch happen between impossible and possible? Um, or at least maybe not um, um, impossible, but at least there exists a coloring. And so let's let's start with K4 and let's do two colors. So our goal is to find a coloring of the edges um, of our K4 with two colors uh, that avoids a rainbow spanning tree. So I can give you such a coloring. I'll color the following edges red. Uh, and this last lone edge blue. And my claim is that there's no rainbow spanning tree in this graph. Um, and the reason really has to deal with um, this partition of the vertex set here. So why can there be no rainbow spanning tree? Well, any spanning tree um, of our K4 must connect uh, U to V in some way. Um, and you can pretty quickly justify to yourself that, well, hey, there's no way to do that without using two red edges. Um, for example, maybe I use the edge UV in my spanning tree, in which case another one of these red crossing edges on the inside must be used to get back to the remaining part of the graph. Uh, and if I don't use that edge UV, then clearly I use uh, two of the, the crossing edges. So certainly in this case, um, no rainbow. Uh, so, train, uh, another but, argument is that the spanning tree must have three edges. So by the pigeonhole yes. principle, you must have a repetition. Sure. Yes, that is that is a is another approach. Um, but this is a, a little bit leading to what we'll see later. This idea. So so yes, that's another approach and probably a simpler approach. Um, but this idea will be um, present later on as well. So no rainbow spanning tree here. Okay, what if I jump up to three colors? So let's uh, draw our K4 here. And maybe I'll color uh, these two edges red, uh, maybe these two edges blue, and maybe these two edges green. And so do we have a rainbow spanning tree here? Uh, yes, I think I see one. I could take this red edge, this green edge, and this blue edge. And there certainly is a rainbow spanning tree. And I'll just use RST from now on to um, 
to talk about these things. Um, and so, of course, this doesn't show that for any three coloring, um, I have a rainbow spanning tree. Um, but it turns out in the case for K4, three is the, or excuse me, two is the maximum number of colors that I can use and avoid a rainbow spanning tree. Um, and so this example motivates the following definition. Um, an edge colored graph H is called rainbow if every edge of H receives a different color, exactly what we talked about before. Um, and the anti Ramsey number of T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees, which we'll denote by R, K, and T, is the maximum number of colors in an edge coloring, um, which has no T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. Now, an important thing to, to mention here um, is this last sentence that in this case, in the edge, uh, edge disjoint case, uh, repeat colors are allowed in distinct trees. So what do I mean? Uh, well, if maybe uh, I have two uh, trees T1 and T2, the color red is allowed to appear within the edges of both T1 and T2, but only once within each tree. Okay, so the color red is allowed across trees, but not um, within. Um, and at this point, um, when I gave this talk on Tuesday in the graduate colloquium, um, there was a very good question that was asked. And the question was, suppose I knew for some KN um, that if I color it with, say, R colors, um, I always have, um, let's just say, a single rainbow spanning tree in this case. The argument's going to apply to T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees as well. Um, but let's suppose I know that anytime I color a K in with R colors, um, I have a rainbow spanning tree. Is it obvious that when I then go to R plus one colors, I still am guaranteed a rainbow spanning tree? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, all I need to do is just pick any color, let's say maybe blue that appears somewhere on the edges, and recolor all of the blue edges, a color that existed somewhere else, let's say red. So I color all of the blue edges red, um, and now I've colored with our colors. So I have an, a, a rainbow spanning tree, um, and either that tree has a red edge or it doesn't. If it doesn't have a red edge, well then when I go back to my old coloring, it's the same tree, so we're still good. Um, if it does contain a red edge, then either it remains red when I go back to my other coloring, or it flips blue, and if it flips blue, well, blue didn't appear anywhere in my first coloring. So I still have um, a rainbow spanning tree. So um, that's the argument there. Uh, so I want to take um, a second to talk about the history of this problem. Um, so in 2001, Bialystocki and uh, Boxman were able to answer the question um, for a single spanning tree. Um, so they were able to show that the anti Ramsey number um, for a single spanning tree is equal to n minus two choose two plus one. Um, and I think that really the best way to get an idea of where these things, these, these numbers are coming from is to talk about the lower bound. Um, so I'll show you the lower bound construction. Uh, and this construction is going to um, sort of persist throughout the, the, the rest of this talk. So um, what is the idea for a single spanning tree? Well, what we'll do is we'll break off a KN minus two, and we'll color every edge within here distinct colors. Okay, so how many colors does this add? Well, of course, the number of edges in KN minus two, which is N minus two choose two. And then just like we did with our toy example at the start, um, we'll isolate two vertices and color every single edge back in um, to our KN minus two red. And so again, by the same argument, and, and this adds our, our plus one color. And now by the same argument that we made before, any spanning tree must connect U and V to the KN minus two, and there's no way to do it without using two red edges. And so um, there's no uh, rainbow spanning tree with this coloring, which tells us that our KN one is greater than or equal to the above number, N minus two choose two plus one. And so, of course, finding the lower bound construction is not too difficult. Um, the difficulty lies in now saying, OK, I've got any coloring with one more color um, show that I can always find a rainbow spanning tree. Um, and that is um, the topic of their paper. OK, so what about for more trees? Um, Akbari and Alipur in 2007 were able to finish the case for two edge disjoint um, rainbow spanning trees, and they have this number, um, which is one more than the previous number. So now we get a, we get to add an extra color. 
Um, to see where this color is coming from, we can do a similar type of argument for the lower bound. So we're looking for a coloring with n minus two choose two plus two colors with no rain, uh, two edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. Um, so what's the construction? Again, we'll break off a kn minus two and color this with distinct colors. So this adds n minus two choose two colors. And now our vertices, which are isolated u and v, um, we'll now add two colors, a single edge of one color, and everything else um, will color red. So why um, does, and so of course this adds my plus two. And so why does this have no two edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees? Uh, well, I think it's fairly easy to see from the same argument before that the first rainbow spanning tree, which we're claiming to exist, must use the blue edge. And once that blue edge is gone, now we run into the same problem that we ran in the last um, argument, that there's no way to connect U and V back to the K and minus two without using two red edges. And so this um, lower bound construction gives us that R K N two is greater than or equal to N minus two choose two plus two. Okay, great. So what about more trees? Uh, yeah, more trees. So Jan Beckham and West in 2016 almost uh, settled the, the whole problem. So they showed that for any positive integer T, the anti-Ramsey number of T edge disjoint uh, rainbow spanning trees is equal to the pattern continues N minus two choose two plus T um, for N larger than this uh, quantity here. And then something slightly different for when N is exactly equal to two T. Um, so first of all, um, where does the N equal to two T come from? Um, well, if our graph is even to contain T edge disjoint um, spanning trees, let alone rainbow spanning trees, it must be able to contain the, the, the T edge disjoint spanning trees. And so how many edges would that add to our graph? Well, each tree has N minus one edges and there's T of them. So we have T times N minus one edges necessarily, and therefore N needs to be large enough so that the complete graph has enough edges. So N choose two needs to be larger than this value. And of course, this is true if and only if T times N minus one is less than or equal to N times N minus one over two, which gives us that two T uh, is less than or equal to N. And so the question is really only meaningful for N larger than um, at least two T. Um, now, of course, if N is smaller, since the graph can't even contain T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees, we're allowed to just color every single edge um, distinct colors. Um, and so the anti-Ramsey number for anything smaller would just be the number of edges. Okay, so I mentioned that this almost solved um, the uh, the entirety of the problem, except for this pesky um, square root um, term here. And so uh, then in 2020, uh, Lincoln and GU were able to completely um, solve the the this problem um, by eliminating that gap that was left by Jan Beckham and West. Um, and so uh, I should mention, uh, where does the, the, the lower bound uh, for this come from? Uh, well, the argument is exactly the same. We'll just break off a KN minus two. And these guys are all distinct colors. So this gives us N minus two choose two colors. And now what we'll do um, is very similarly um, to before, we'll color N minus, uh, sorry, T minus one uh, unique colors here. Sorry, I shouldn't have used yellow. We'll do T minus one uh, distinct colors there, then we'll color everything else red. And this runs into exactly the same problem that we had before. Um, the first T minus one trees must use at least one of those um, distinct colors in the crossing. Um, and then when we get down to the last tree, there's no way to connect U and V again uh, without using two red edges. Um, so that's the lower bound there. Um, and so this um, completely um, solved the problem um, for the case uh, of the complete graph Kn. And so recently, um, there's been some interest in finding anti-Ramsey numbers uh, when we instead play the game on a different host graph. Um, so this, there was this paper from uh, Zhao Lu and Zhang um, very early on in this year, I think February or some, some, something around there um, this year, where they instead decided to play the game on the complete bipartite graph. Um, and so they have this result here, and you'll notice that they almost tell the whole story again, except for this square root factor. 
Um, and this is because they followed very closely the paper of Jan Beckham and West, um, but instead playing the game on the complete bipartite graph. Um, and so Gio Lincoln and I thought, well, hey, maybe we can apply the same techniques um, that Lincoln and Gio did in 2020 to finish the case for KN um, to finish the, the, the problem for the complete bipartite graph. Um, and it turns out that actually we can do a little bit better. Um, and so to state our results, um, first, a couple of definitions. Uh, if G is a graph and P is a partition of its vertex set, CRPG is going to be the set of all crossing edges of G with respect to the partition. So these are the edges whose endpoints are in different parts of the partition. And then EPG is the set of all non-crossing edges. So these are the edges um, with both endpoints in the same part. Um, so just maybe to draw a picture. Uh, these blue edges are the crossing edges, so maybe something like this, um, and these red edges um, are the um, non-crossing edges. And so uh, our result says the following, um, for any multigraph G, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the fact that everything applies to multigraphs, um, you know, if there's any loops, um, we can color all of those unique colors since they don't add anything to, to spanning trees. And then none of the results that we need um, differ when we talk about multigraphs. So um, for simplicity, just keep thinking of everything as a sim simple graph, but um, nothing breaks in the case for, for multigraphs. Um, if there is a partition P naught of the vertices of G, which satisfies the number of crossing edges is less than T times size of P minus one, then the anti Ramsey number is equal to the number of edges of G. Um, I'll talk about in a second where this is coming from. I'm sure probably some of us already know why this is the case, um, but um, this is in some sense like the degenerate cases, like the not very interesting ones. So this is the reason that I've um, sort of started this first, or uh, uh, sorry, paused the, the, the slide here um, just to take a second and say, this is in some sense the degenerate cases. And really the, the, the result is um, here that otherwise the anti Ramsey number of any host graph for T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. So remember we set out trying to um, uh, finish the case for complete bipartite graphs, but instead we were actually able to determine the anti Ramsey number for any host graph of T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees is given by this maximum uh, where we take the maximum over all partitions with at least three parts, um, the number of edges contained within that partition plus T times the size of the partition minus two. Um, and in a couple of slides, I'll talk about a little bit more where this number is coming from and hopefully make it a little less um, mystifying. But right now I'll say it relates back to those lower bound constructions that we were um, working with a second ago. Um, okay. Um, so I wanna take a second to, to show that the um, results that were known about the complete graph and the complete bipartite graph can be re rederived quickly. I'm not gonna go through all of the, the details here, but I just wanna give you an idea of how um, you can use our results to rederive um, the known theorems. Um, and it turns out, oh, this should really say f of s. Um, if f of s is defined as this maximum where we only look at the partitions with exactly s parts, um, it's not too hard to show that that function is actually concave up. Um, and then remember, we also have that t times size of p uh, minus two term, which is of course concave. So their sum is concave. And so we only need to check the maximums at the boundaries when the size of p is equal to three and when the size of p is equal to n. Um, and, then, and then it's just arithmetic. You just check and it turns out that uh, what our um, uh, function spits out is the same as the, the known results. Um, and then in a similar fashion, um, because that function is concave up, for the complete bipartite graph. Uh, you can also close the gap um, from Zhao Lu and Zhang's results um, and get this, this result here. And another class of graphs that it's fairly easy to check um, the values for would just be the multipartite graphs. It's essentially the same thing as the bipartite graphs, just um, slightly more notation. Okay. So let's continue. Um, I would be remiss to, to, to give a talk involving T-edge disjoint spanning trees and not mention Nash Williams. Um, so, it, you know, one of the, the most famous theorems in, in graph theory, and, and certainly um, for me, I think it, it, it might have been the first, the first time where I saw um, sort of something where the necessity was so clearly obvious, um, uh, where, but the sufficiency was just mystical to me. You know, it, 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 
it, it, you have to be very clever to, to prove the reverse direction, but I can show you the, the, the proof of the forward direction in you know, a few minutes, um, which I'll do right now. Um, so let's take some, uh, let's first suppose uh, G contains a T edge disjoint spanning trees. Uh, and let's take any partition of the vertex set. Maybe it looks something like this. And so there will be edges crossing this partition, maybe something like this. Um, so this is part one, part two, part three, part four. Um, and what we'll do is we'll build an auxiliary graph um, where the vertex set are the partitions, the, sorry, the parts in the partition. So this is P1, this is P2, this is P3, and this is P4. And we'll add an edge exactly when there's at least one crossing edge with endpoints um, in uh, either partition, part of the partition. Um, and now this auxiliary graph has a nice property. And that property is that it must be connected. Um, if it's not connected, well, then when we blow back up to the original graph, there must be some disconnect between these parts. Um, and why is that an issue? Well, we claim that G contains at least one spanning tree. Since we have one spanning tree, G has to be connected. So this clearly can't happen. So this means that this guy, our auxiliary graph, has at least the number of parts minus one edges. And this uh, argument that I just made, we can do T times over. We can remove um, P minus one edges and still contain um, a spanning tree. Um, and therefore uh, the argument holds T different times. And so we must have at least T times size of P minus one edges, uh, crossing edges in the, the original graph. So again, you know, it only takes two or three minutes to, to convince yourself that the necessity um, is true. Um, but you know, as with so many theorems in, in, in graph theory, the sufficiency is, is very difficult um, and you have to be really clever to prove. Um, okay, uh, so then there's this theorem of Schreiber from 2003, which has a very, very similar flavor and is slightly more applicable, applicable to our problem. So an edge colored graph G contains T color disjoint. Okay, color disjoint rainbow spanning trees. In the color disjoint case, now we're no longer allowing repeat colors across the different trees. So every single color that appears within the T edge disjoint spanning trees must be unique. Um, so we contain T color disjoint rainbow spanning trees if and only if for every partition of the vertices of G, the number of colors which cross the partition is at least this Nash-Williams type T times size of P minus one. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll mention this um, a couple times um, in the future. Um, it's not directly applicable to what we're doing because we have a little bit more freedom, right? We're allowed to distribute colors um, to different trees, um, but nonetheless, it is still um, very useful. Okay, so I wanna go back to our theorem um, and show the lower bound to you to get a little bit of, of information on um, where this is coming from. Uh, so the first line for any graph G, if there exists a partition of vertices with not enough crossing edges, then the anti-Ramsey number is equal to the number of edges of G. This is directly Nash-Williams. Uh, why? Because uh, if I have a partition which doesn't have enough edges in the crossing, I can't even contain T edge disjoint spanning trees, let alone T rainbow edge disjoint spanning trees. Um, and so I can just color every single edge a new color and there's not gonna be T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. Um, so this is why I mentioned this is somehow the, the degenerate case. Okay, but for the more interesting part, um, we uh, made the claim that the anti-Ramsey number uh, in any graph um, of T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees is equal to this maximum here. And so I wanna take a second to show you the construction for the lower bound. So what is it we wanna show? We wanna show that this anti-Ramsey number is at least this large. Um, so what we need to do is exhibit a coloring with at least this many colors um, with no T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. And so how do we do it? Well, what we'll do um, is we'll take a partition with at least three parts and we'll select T times size of P minus two minus one crossing edges and color them in distinct colors. So this um, here is the reason that we need to have at least three parts. Um, if we only chose partitions with two parts, well, then this number would be equal to minus one, which of course makes no sense. So we need to have at least three parts. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll color the remaining crossing edges in a new color 
um, which we'll call C naught, and the remaining non-crossing edges all in distinct colors. Okay, so let's draw a picture and see what's going on. So maybe here um, is our partition with at least three parts. And so everything in here is going to be distinct colors. So how many colors does this add? Well, this is definitely the number of edges, um, non-crossing edges. Uh, then what we'll do is we will select T times the size of P minus two uh, minus one colors. So here we have T times the size of P minus two minus one crossing edges, um, which will all be unique colors. And then everything else is gonna get the color green in the crossing. So that adds our plus one. Okay, so we have the prescribed number of colors. Um, and why does this contain no um, T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees? Well, every spanning tree must have Uh, size of P minus one crossing edges, okay? Um, and of those crossing edges, um, at most, uh, one can be green, okay? So at most, um, at most, uh, maybe let me phrase this. Um, we'll say, because at most one can be green, um, at least, size of P minus two are not green. And since we're claiming we have T edge disjoint uh, rainbow spanning trees, this implies T times size of P minus two, uh, not green. Crossing edges, uh, which is a contradiction. We only colored T times size of P minus two minus one things in the crossing, not green. Um, Okay, so that gets us the lower bound. Um, and now the remaining difficulty um, is to prove the upper bound. So we want to color with one more color, show that no matter what, um, we always get T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. And so what is the difficulty? Well, unlike in the color disjoint case of Shriver, we're allowed to have deficient bipartitions, or sorry, just deficient bipartitions. Um, what do I mean by deficient? Well, I mean partitions which have many duplicate colors, right? In Shriver's case, we needed to have many, many distinct colors in the crossing. Um, but for us, we can take those deficiencies, the duplicate colors, and distribute them across the trees um, and somehow fix the, the deficiencies um, according to Shriver. Um, and so the following lemma formalizes what I've just said and gives us a technical tool to use. So if G is an edge colored graph, um, if we have a family F1 through FT of edge disjoint rainbow spanning forests of G now, so the forests are allowed to have duplicate colors across them, um, we say that F1 through FT has a color disjoint extension in G if exactly what you expect to happen. We can extend each of the F1 through FT in a color disjoint way, meaning all of the edges that we use to extend the FIs um, do not appear anywhere else. Um, and we can extend them each to, to a spanning tree um, in an edge disjoint way as well. Um, so that's the idea there. And then in 2020, um, Lincoln and Xu were able to give us the following result, which has a similar flavor to, to Shriver and Nash Williams. Um, if G is an edge colored graph and F1 through FT are a family of edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees, if for every partition of the vertices of G, um, this inequality holds, so we have a similar Nash Williams T times size of P minus one, but then we have this um, quantity here, which we'll talk about in a second. Then you can extend the FI. And so what is this doing? So G prime here in the inequality is the graph that we get when we remove all of the edges, um, which have colors that appear somewhere in the FI. Okay, so you remember the, um, the color disjoint extension means we're extending color just disjointly. So we don't want to include any of the colors that we used in the FI. Um, and so how does this help us? Well, you can imagine if I've got a partition um, that is deficient in the sense that maybe it's got many repeated red edges. Well, what I can do is I can now distribute 
F3, and maybe, you know, maybe we've got more. I could distribute those three red edges to the first three of these forests, say, and then what happens to this inequality? Uh, well, the left-hand side, the colors in the crossing decreases by at most one, right? So this decreases by at most one. I could have only lost one color in the crossing by do this, by doing this, but the number of crossing edges um, with respect uh, to P of the FI has increased by three. And so in some sense, I'm fixing these deficiencies, right? Before, um, just the number of colors crossing was not enough. And so I removed some of the duplicate colors, added them to the FI and bumped this left-hand side up to make it less deficient. Okay, so that's the kind of game um, that we're playing. So um, from now on, let's assume that G is a graph which satisfies um, Nash-Williams. So it, it does have T-edge disjoint spanning trees um, and is colored with this many colors. Uh, we'd like some way to get an idea on just how deficient partitions can be. If it were the case that um, some partitions could have um, you know, terribly few colors crossing, we might be in trouble because it maybe would be likely that we can't um, fix them with this um, um, extension lemma. And so it turns out actually that the partitions can't be too deficient. Um, so I, bef before I state that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two um, definitions. So A to PG is gonna be the number of edges um, within the partition minus the number of colors which appear within the partition. Um, and so this, this number is a little bit mysterious, but to me, it kind of is like um, how far away from our lower bound example we are. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, remember that in our lower bound, construction, um, every edge within the partition got different colors. And so this number would be zero for our lower bound. Um, and then let's uh, the second quantity is C of PG. And this is gonna be the number of colors which appear within the edges and in the crossing, sorry, within the uh, non-crossing and crossing edges. Um, and again, this is somehow how far away we are from the lower bound uh, construction. You can imagine that uh, or sorry, you, you remember that the lower bound construction had no colors shared within the parts and in the crossing. Okay, and then we can do um, sort of a slick application of the inclusion exclusion principle on these two sets to get this equality here. So where is this coming from? Well, certainly I can write the number of colors on the edges of G as the number of colors in the crossing uh, unioned with the number of colors in the edges sorry, within the parts, and we have this minus EPG. And then applying the inclusion exclusion principle here, we get this is the number of colors in the crossing of PG plus the number of colors on the edges uh, within the parts. And then what do we have? Well, we need to subtract away those colors which belong to the crossing and uh, uh, within the parts. And that's our C, so we have minus C, P, G. Um, and then we have uh, minus number of edges. Uh, and then, uh, yes. And so now um, the plus C uh, colors within minus the number of edges, that is of course our negative eta. So these two guys combine, these two terms combine here to give us our minus eta pg. Okay, so that's where this equality is coming from. And so why is this equality useful? Well, since the number of colors is larger than this maximum over all partitions, um, we get the following corollary. Um, so you, you can imagine that um, uh, for any partition with at least three parts, um, I'll just slap a greater than or equal to on here and place this maximum over here. And then since this maximum is taken over all partitions with at least uh, uh, three parts, uh, whatever partition with three parts I chose, I can replace um, this maximum with that partition. And then the minus uh, EPG will cancel um, and we get the following corollary that um, if P is a partition with at least three parts, excuse me, if P is a partition with at least three parts, then the number of colors which cross P is at least, and this is exactly um, what we had before, we add across the A to PG, the CPG, and the plus one, 
and then the um, number of edges of PG cancel. Um, and then two, so this doesn't apply for um, partitions with size two, which I'll call bipartitions in the future. Um, why? Well, because we need to use that fact that the maximum is taken over only partitions of size um, at least three. But it does work out if it so happens that the number of colors on the edges of G is strictly larger than the number of edges within um, the parts of our partition. Uh, and then we get a similar thing. Um, and so why is this result, this corollary nice? Um, well, for lack of a better term, it means that we can be kind of lazy with how we construct the FI. Um, this is probably the most technical um, thing in the, in, in the paper. Um, but really what I mean is this thing in parentheses that when we're building the FI to use the extension lemma, we only need to ensure that when we're adding edges into the FI, um, we are uh, not uh, increasing the number of colors, uh, this quantity on the right, uh, too much. Um, and so again, for lack of a better word, it means we can be kind of lazy with how, how we construct the FI um, uh, because our deficiencies are, are not too large um, across many partitions. Okay, um, so with that corollary, um, we are ready um, to start the proof. Okay, so let's, um, for the sake of contradiction, suppose that G is an edge minimal counterexample um, that does not satisfy um, our claim. Okay, um, and so what we'll do uh, first, uh, we'll suppose that there exists a partition uh, with at least three parts um, with the number of crossing edges equal to the minimum according to Nash Williams. Um, so in this case, um, the, the number of colors on the edges of G, uh, we can calculate that exactly. Um, this maximum, uh, you know, you can rewrite the number of edges within the parts as the number of edges of G minus the number of edges in the crossing. Oops, sorry, not number of colors, number of edges in the crossing. And so finding this maximum is equivalent to finding the, the minimum of the, the crossing, um, number of crossing edges. Um, and here we've achieved the, the minimum possible number of crossing edges with this partition. Um, and so we can uh, calculate exactly the number of colors on the edges. Um, and that number of colors is equal to the number of edges minus T plus one. Uh, because remember, we've colored with this many colors plus one colors. Um, okay, so how is this useful? Um, well, it turns out that for any bipartition P prime, the number of edges in P prime uh, should be equal to the number of edges of G minus their crossing. Um, well, that number, the smallest the crossing can possibly be is T for bipartitions. Um, and so this is less than or equal to the number of edges of G minus T, um, which is strictly less than the number of colors on the edges of G. So why is this useful? Well, now every single partition satisfies our corollary um, from before. And it means that we can be, again, for lack of a better term, lazy with the way that we construct um, our forests. And so then all you need to do, um, since the number of edges, or sorry, the number of colors um, is, is very large, then we can sort of very easily just greedily construct the FI. Um, and it turns out that they will satisfy the, the lazy condition. And this fixes all of the partitions with um, respect to the extension lemma. Um, and we're good to go. Okay, um, so that handles the case when there exists a partition um, which meets the minimum. Um, in my opinion, this is sort of the less interesting case. And the more interesting case is, is case two, where for any partition with at least three parts, the number of crossing edges is at least T times size of P minus one plus one. Okay, now as with any, you know, assume our graph is edge minimal, what we'd really like to do is somehow remove an edge, show that it still satisfies the assumptions, and then get to apply um, our hypothesis. So how would we do that? Well, we'll do that with the following claim. Uh, we claim that there exists an edge with color multiplicity at least two, whose removal maintains that for every partition, the number of crossing edges um, is at least uh, the minimum, according to Nash Williams. Um, so there's a couple of things here. First, um, it doesn't matter what edge I remove, all partitions with size at least three are still happy. They still have at least T times size of P minus one crossing edges 
Why? Because I've only removed one edge. And since we're in case two, every partition with size at least three has one more than the minimum necessary. Okay, so we certainly do not need to worry about uh, any of the, the partitions of size three. So then the question is, what about the partitions of size two? Well, if any sort of bad bipartition exists in the sense that removing an edge um, makes it have not enough crossing edges, um, then there must be um, exactly T crossing edges in that partition. And so now my claim is that there can only be at most two such bipartitions. Okay, and to see that, um, first, what we'll do is we'll take their intersection. Okay, so suppose P1 and P2 are two bipartitions for which there are exactly T crossing edges in uh, their, their crossing. Then if we look at their intersection, the number of edges in the crossing of their intersection is certainly at most the sum of the crossing edges um, with respect to P1 and P2. Um, if they're disjoint, then there's equality, um, or they could share some crossing edges, in which case um, you're still smaller. Uh, and we know that number is equal to 2t by assumption. So why is this an issue? Well, no matter how I intersect two bipartitions, unless they're the same bipartition, there has to be at least three parts um, in that new partition. Um, and so we have that the number of crossing edges in the intersection of the two uh, bipartitions is at most 2t um, from the previous line. And that's less than or equal to t times the size of P1 intersect P2 minus one, but this partition, P1 intersect P2, definitely has at least three parts. Um, and so that contradicts the fact that we're in case two. So at most one um, bad bipartition can exist. So let P be that bad bipartition. And then since, the, um, uh, uh, since we're in case two, uh, this maximum is less than or equal to the number of edges of G minus T minus one. And so the number of colors on the edges is at most number of edges of G uh, minus T. And now certainly um, there must be at least one color that has multiplicity two. If every color has multiplicity one, meaning that they only appear on one edge, um, then G contain T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees to begin with. So if C1 is the number of colors with multiplicity one in G, it's definitely true that C1 is less than or equal to the number of colors minus one, um, which with the above inequality gives us less than or equal to the number of edges of G minus T minus one. And then if we take the graph G2, which we get by deleting all of the edges that have um, colors appearing elsewhere in the graph at least once, um, then the number of edges of G2 is definitely equal to the number of edges of G minus C1, right? After I remove um, every edge with a unique color, everything else contributes an edge to G2. Um, and then with the above inequality, we get that the number of edges of G2 is equal to T plus one. And so how does this help us? Well, since P was a bipartition, which is bad in the sense that if I remove any, it, it has T edges in the crossing, um, I know that there's T plus one edges with multiplicity at least two. And so at least one of them must be outside of the crossing of P. And so that edge I'm allowed to remove and our previous claim is proven. So what have I shown? Shown that I can take an edge um, whose removal um, maintains Nash-Williams for the existence of T edge disjoint spanning trees in the graph after I've removed the edge. And also that edge um, doesn't lower the number of colors on the graph. Okay, so how does this help us? Um, since G was chosen to be edge minimal, we must have that the anti-Ramsey number of G without E of T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees is less than or equal to um, the maximum that we've seen uh, many times now. And now how does this maximum um, relate to the maximum uh, for G? Well, this uh, quantity here for any partition, the number of edges within the parts um, can only decrease. There's no way that I could ever add an edge um, by removing an edge. And therefore this is certainly less than or equal to um, the maximum if we replace that with G. But now how many colors um, did we color the edges of G without E with? Well, the same number of colors that we colored G with because E was chosen to have color multiplicity at least two. So we removed that edge, didn't remove any colors. And so our G of T is colored with this many colors plus one. 
And therefore, G without E must contain T edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. And therefore, so does G. And that finishes the proof. So that's all I've got for you guys. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for listening. And here are a bunch of references. And the paper is on archive if you'd like to take a deeper look. All right, thanks, Drew. Um, maybe we could uh, thank Drew in some way. And uh, let me open, uh, open it up for questions. So I would like to ask a question, which is a conceptually simpler problem, since it would have fewer quantifier. So you have a graph which color the edges. Is there a polynomial time algorithm to find the maximum number of these joint rainbow spanning trees? Hmm. I don't immediately see a clever way. It's definitely an interesting question. So, you, so you're saying you, it, you see that there was this long literature. So, yeah. So, so, so you're saying you're you're inputting uh, a graph with a coloring. Yes. And you and you want to output the maximum number of edge disjoint rainbow spanning trees. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know much. I don't know much about it. Are there any other questions for Drew? Um, I, have, I have a quick question um, about your main result. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of, uh, so you applied that to different families of, of graphs or, or you, you had some, you had an application slide, I think you called it or, or something yes. like that. And uh, get there, here you go. So you had these three families, you have the complete graph, the complete bipartite graph and then multi-partite multi graphs. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this might be obvious. I haven't really thought about how this works or not, but when you apply your main result to these families of graphs, does something special happen to where it becomes concave up or would it be concave up in a lot of cases or uh, is there any intuition for that? Well, uh, part of the reason is that it's, it's easy to calculate the, these maximums at, at the boundary. Um, I'm not sure what quantifications you would need to ensure that this function is concave up for an arbitrary graph. Or maybe Lincoln a... can maybe Lincoln can say something more than than me there, but I don't I don't immediately see for for an arbitrary graph how to determine whether this function is concave up. And uh, no obvious uh, condition you can justify. I think. So. You can construct a graph which is not concave up, but you can take some graph and that blow up. Um, but uh, in general, it's, it's uh, we don't know how to whether the test the graph is a con the function concave up or not. The reason we include it here because uh, some people solved for the complete bipartite graph, and they have a gap. We had to address for this special case what is the right solution. Mm -hmm. And more generally, you know, it's uh, the third one is really just the uh, easy generalization for the second case. I was just curious if there was any intuition as to other families of graphs that this might be like nicely applied to or, or something like that. But um, I understand that the, I guess the original question was to solve the bipartite case. Yeah. So, very cool. All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Drew? All right, if not, let's thank Drew one more time. And um, uh, I appreciate everybody coming out today. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this is uh, 
uh, bad to say quite so early in the semester, but I am ready for a long weekend. And um, <laughs> that being said, I, I hope everyone uh, enjoys their long weekend. So I think that's all for, for today. So um, <laughs> I'll see everyone next week. Bye.